Let's start, off, let's start off with a kind of broader question about gold and where it's going. Seb was just uh, talking there about the fact that the Chinese yields are climbing. We touched 4%. Um, and, and the kind of... The, the gold story makes a lot of sense in a low-yielding environment. I've got a chart here for you. Uh, and this is US tips and, and gold. So this is the real yield. And they kind of have an inverse relationship, and you can see that quite clearly. If yields start climbing, if inflation starts to come back, a, do you expect that to happen? And B, what will be the impact on gold? Well, I am definitely an inflation bull, so to speak. So I do expect the inflation in the Western world to pick up in the uh, few years to come, uh, underpinned by increase uh, in oil price and uh, uh, by the general uh, uh, price pressure coming from many, many years uh, of uh, loose money. And uh, that, I believe, uh, will be positive for gold. This is an interesting chart, but another chart to look at would be uh, to look at the relationship between gold price and nominal interest rates. And you would see that uh, at the same level of real interest rates, uh, the higher the nominal interest rate is, the higher the price of gold is. So my bet would be as the nominal interest rates rise and the real interest rates uh, uh, keep steady, uh, gold will benefit. So gold is on an upward trajectory? Uh, that's my opinion, yes. By, give me a sense of kind of, does it just tick along? Does it start to sort of it just gradually continues to rise or is, or is it significantly mispriced now to relative to where we're going? Well, I'm not, I, I, I don't think there is mispricing now because yeah. uh, there is still a significant uncertainty in the market. But I think in the uh, most likely scenario, we should uh, uh, see gold rising towards $1,500 per ounce. We, we see gold kind of stuck in this range. Um, it's every time I look at it, trading somewhere around $1,300 uh, a troy ounce. What, what do you need to see to get it out of that range? What could move really significantly the gold price? Well, in my opinion, I think we uh, should first see uh, the uh, return of uh, significant inflation, most importantly to uh, the U.S. economy. And that return is likely uh, to be triggered by the increase uh, in crude oil prices. I think as soon as uh, the increase in oil price filters through, uh, to increase inflation, uh, we should see uh, gold regain its footing and uh, get out of, uh, out of the range. I wonder, you know, historically you've seen people in countries whose currencies are, uh, are weak using gold as a way to get out to avoid, obviously, the massive inflation that you'd, you've seen in the past, say, in uh, Venezuela, for example. Um, or Argentina. You also see people in countries like China um, use gold to get their uh, money out of the yuan or maybe even offshore. Lately, you've been seeing people use Bitcoin for those purposes. Do you think digital currencies in some way take a little bit of the shine off of gold? Well, uh, I believe the primary purpose uh, of investing in gold um, uh, by the citizens of uh, countries with problematic monetary systems is not really to get money out of the country. It's more to provide them with the security of the means of payment in the event of an unforeseen and significant disruption to the country's financial system. And I think Bitcoin is pretty useless for this purpose. You cannot, in all of those countries, use Bitcoin to pay for bread or for clothes, or uh, you cannot use Bitcoin to buy a new car. Um, so I believe uh, uh, Bitcoin has a bright future, uh, but it is not a competitor to gold. Gold will retain its role um, as uh, uh, the insurance currency, uh, which is uh, useful in the event of the general breakdown of the monetary system. Uh, so I don't think uh, competition with Bitcoin, which is uh, currently a topic du jour uh, in some circles, uh, uh, will impact gold price uh, in, the, uh, in the long term. I have to admit, we have been talking about it a fair bit over the last few days and weeks. Um, Vitaly, the stock seems to be rising very nicely this morning. Uh, polymetal stock up uh, really quite sharply this morning on the back of, I think, the dividend story and the fact that the capex is not going to end up impacting that. Curious to know, though, there's some, some talk you may re domicile to Cyprus. Why would you do that? Well, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the typical moves that uh, are being considered by uh, some of the Russian companies. Uh, now, Cyprus uh, is uh, uh, a relatively unique uh, uh, jurisdiction in that it combines uh, the qualities of uh, 
uh, a tax-friendly jurisdiction uh, uh, with uh, the quality of not being on the blacklist uh, of the international organization uh, um, uh, against uh, the uh, 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 against the money trafficking. So uh, this is kind of a midway uh, destination uh, for a lot of Russian companies. Uh, we are definitely looking at this opportunity, uh, but the decision has not been taken. And uh, we uh, are thinking not only about the taxation issues, but yep. also about the investor perception issues, because currently we are domiciled in Jersey, which is a much more familiar uh, jurisdiction uh, for UK investors. So this is the step uh, we will not take lightly uh, in any case, and the decision has not been taken. Yeah, I, I grew up in Guernsey, so we don't talk about the Jersey people very often. <laughs> very different conversation. Um, let's let's um, just, just finally kind of wrap it up a little bit. What, one of the things that I spoke to the, to the governor of the Russian Central Bank when I saw her a, a few months back was what's happening with Otrika. Um, how, concern, how concerning is it what happened with that bank? You had dealings with the bank, and I know you talk about the fact that you have a diversified exposure to, to, the, to the banking system in Russia, but there are concerns that other institutions may fall under similar, similar sort of um, uh, situations. Do you, do you, how are you managing your banking relationship in Russia? Well, I think, first of all, uh, the way the Russian Central Bank handled this situation uh, is exemplary uh, because uh, they moved in quite resolutely and prevented the bank's meltdown and avoided uh, any collateral damage uh, either to depositors or actually to the banking clients. And the same uh, story has uh, repeated itself with uh, BAN Bank. Yep. Uh, we definitely are trying to monitor the uh, risk of our banking counterparties. Uh, and uh, uh, we have actually moved away from a treaty for some time before the troubles started. Uh, so I believe uh, our internal risk management policies ensure that we are not exposed uh, to any uh, banking counterparty which may fall prey uh, to its internal problems. The weakening of the ruble uh, was incredible after Crimea, but has gained strength over the last year until the last few weeks. Um, do you think it's stable now? Uh, stable now, and uh, how does that affect your operating costs? Well, clearly we were significant beneficiaries of ruble weakening because uh, a large chunk uh, of our operating costs uh, is in domestic currency. Uh, and uh, I believe now with the uh, current stability of the domestic currency, we are also beneficiaries because the domestic inflation is falling. Uh, that ensures a pretty stable operating environment and the ability to plan for the longer term. Uh, so actually, uh, I'm looking forward to continued stability of the domestic currency and to the decrease uh, in uh, domestic interest rates, because that will help a lot uh, uh, our contractors and suppliers, who in turn will be able to pass some of those savings uh, to us as the ultimate consumer of their goods and services.